I'm in the process of repairing and restoring this vintage HP 85B computer. In the video so far in this series, we've taken the unit apart. It actually booted up um, fairly easily once I'd received it. And uh, really I've been going through tidying it up and getting the peripheral devices to work. So uh, that's the uh, tape drive and the printer. The printer kind of worked, but the paper would jam up and uh, it didn't really print very clearly and it would uh, tear the paper. So that was just really a case of taking it apart and cleaning it. And uh, then I moved on to the tape drive and as usual with these machines, the drive roller for the tape transport had kind of uh, turned to goo and uh, wouldn't drive the tape. So I showed um, how I could uh, go about making a replacement for that and uh, it worked fine. And uh, I could uh, read tapes, uh, write uh, to tapes, so I could save programs. And I was actually in the process of experimenting with different um, drive wheel materials, just really so I could do a follow-up video uh, showing different uh, methods, different materials that could be used for this, different ways to um, make, them, uh, make the roller for the, uh, the drive. Um, but I encountered a problem now. This is not an uncommon problem. In fact, it's probably um, applicable to every single one of these machines uh, that's in general use. And that is, while the drive itself was working reasonably reliably, it would uh, keep failing to either read or write tapes. And of course, as probably everyone that deals with these knows, that came down to the tape itself. So. It's a very well-known uh, problem with these uh, machines, or in particular with the type of tape that um, was used in these machines. It's used in other types of machine as well. There are quite a few YouTube videos showing um, this very issue and how to deal with it. And um, I'm going to uh, basically duplicate uh, what other people have already done. I'm going to do it my own way, of course. Um, but what we need to do is find a solution for this. Uh, so to start with, we'll look at what the problem actually is. So I'll get the computer out of the way and we'll look at one of the tapes and see what the actual problem is with them. So I've got one of the tapes here. As you can see, I've taken it apart. And this was a new old stock tape. It was sealed when I got it. And I had another one and that had exactly the same problem. And the problem is that when you try and use them, they'll, they may work for a short time but then they'll start uh, chewing up the tape inside the cassette. And um, this particular one was no exception. I took it apart a few times and, and re-spooled the tape. Uh, but the, um, the problem with these is this transport um, belt. And the way these tapes work is quite interesting. I'll just grab a piece of uh, paper tape so I can demonstrate this a bit more clearly. So I've got a piece of um, paper tape here. So this will represent the uh, tape itself. So if we start to coil this up, so wrap it around in itself. It's obviously quite loose. And we end up with a loosely coiled piece of paper. Um, but on the tape cassette, you need the tape to be fairly well uh, kind of compressed and, and tightly wound onto the spools. So the way this works is the tape's not actually attached to any of the spools. It's just loosely wound around them. And the idea is that when the tape's put under tension, it can slide around on the reel and it will effectively do that and it will tighten up. So as you condition the tape which is just really driving it from end to end what you're doing is effectively this you're putting some pressure on the outside of the reel and you're putting it under tension and that causes it to compress now if you imagine there was um, something inside here then eventually it would be pulled tightly onto it and that enables the tape to be uh, kind of compressed and, and, and properly uh, retentioned without the need to actually pull directly on the tape from the reel. So the reels are not driven, it just relies on tension on the tape to keep the tape tightly spooled 
on the two reels. So what actually drives this is this belt and this belt should go across these two pulleys and then it goes around the two reels on the outside of the tape it actually runs on the tape itself around this drive wheel and it's a continuous loop so as you turn this wheel it causes this belt to run around and it will turn the two reels so it does that through friction between the uh, drive belt and the tape itself and it's driving both reels and because it's it's not very stretchy it's, it's kind of fairly it is it will stretch a little bit but it's, it's not particularly elastic so it causes the tape to be put under some tension and it causes it to reel quite tightly onto the two spools and then as you turn this wheel it will move the tape one way or the other so there's almost no backlash you can drive the tape in both directions and in theory you should keep it tightly wound onto the two spools now the problem that you get, and this incidentally is the the wheel that you drive through the roller that we changed. So all we really do to move this is we just turn this roller th using friction between the roller and the rubber drive wheel on the cassette drive. And that's all we need to do, but the problem with these is that this drive belt has a tendency to degrade, and as you can see the problem with this one, it started to disintegrate. Uh, and on top of that, um, as these age, the tape and the belt start sticking together. So what generally causes these to fail is that as it winds uh, the tape around and this belt runs on the tape, the tape will eventually stick to this belt and it will get pulled around and kind of mangled up and chewed up. And as I say, although you can take these apart fairly easily and re-spool them, uh, the tape is generally ruined and at the very least these things once they start to fail are history there's there's no real way to uh, recover them you can replace these you can find uh, these drive belts on other cassettes uh, that will fit now i think you can get replacements but in all honesty it's not really worth trying to repair these unless you absolutely need to if you've got something critical on them that you need to recover uh, but i so I've had this problem before and many many people have had this problem so um, I'm not going to go down this route so I'm not going to buy any more of these tapes they are horrendously expensive anyway uh, but what I do have is a large pile of these so I've got quite a few of these these are DC 2000s and these were used uh, in computer backup uh, drives and other machines like this so as I said, other uh, YouTubers have uh, posted videos on, uh, on using these in this machine and other machines. So we'll have a quick look at this and we'll go over how to modify the tape drive to use one of these tapes. So the first thing we'll do, we'll just reassemble this tape so that we can compare them directly. Uh, I'm not going to bother putting the belt back in, I'm not going to reuse this tape. Uh, but we'll compare it uh, alongside the DC2000 and see how easily uh, it will, uh, how big a job it will be to modify the drive to accept this type of tape. So I've got the DC2000 tape here on the left and the original HP tape here on the right. And uh, at first sight, they look fairly similar. If we flip them over then the base plate looks very similar. In fact, it's identical. You can actually swap the base plate off the DC2000 onto the original HP and vice versa. It will fit. Um, so that's fine. It's the same thickness base plate. The flap to expose the tape is in the same place and the actuating part of it is also in the same place. So that's not a problem. Uh, however, that's um, where uh, things start to change on the two tapes. Notice on the DC2000, the tape is a lot thicker than the tape on the original HP. Now, that actually doesn't matter um, in itself. Um, as long as the tape passes over the read-write head, it doesn't matter what part of the tape 
the data is written onto. As long as it's consistent and it's written to the same part of the tape every time and the same part of the tape passes over the head every time so it can be read, it doesn't matter which part of the tape it is. So uh, that's fine, it doesn't matter that the tape's wider and if we look at this we can see that um, if you imagine superimposing the HP tape on the DC2000 cart uh, cartridge relative to the bottom of the base plate you'll notice that the uh, tape would overlap the wider DC2000 tapes. In other words, the DC2000 tape will successfully pass over the read-write head in the tape drive. But the cartridge itself is taller, so um, luckily it won't cause a problem in our machine. We'll have a look at that in a few minutes. Um, but where we encounter the biggest headache is the drive itself. So. If you recall the tape is driven uh, using a rubber roller on the tape drive and it just presses against this black drive wheel so it spans probably about this position and uh, just presses against this part of the cassette when we press the cassette into the drive. The problem here is that the position or the relative position of the uh, drive wheel on the DC 2000 is a lot higher up. So if I use my tweezers here as kind of a gauge, notice that if I put the well, one prong of the tweezers on the bottom edge of the plate, then the other one is just underneath the start of the drive uh, wheel. And if I do the same thing here, notice there's quite a big gap. It's about two millimeters, two and a half millimeters uh, higher on the DC 2000. But it is pretty much the same width. It's actually very slightly narrower, but it's pretty much the same width uh, in terms of its um, uh, the width of the part of the uh, wheel we need to drive. It's just higher up. Um, in terms of the right protection uh, mechanism, then it's uh, fine. We've got this tab here that slides across on the original HP cassette, and on the DC2000 it is uh, identical looking from the front um, but because the cassette is taller uh, then what we need is for the tab to be slightly different and luckily it is. So if we look at the tab edge on then um, this is the part of the tab that is um, used to actuate the switch on the drive to let the drive know whether the tape is in right protect mode uh, but luckily on the DC2000 that tab is extended downwards so again if we use the tweezers here then you'll notice that if I go from the top edge of the plate we're just in line with the bottom edge of that tab on the DC2000 and if we do the same thing on the original tape you'll notice that the height is pretty much identical so in other words the switch will press on this part of the uh, read write protect slide on the original HP tape and it will press on the bottom edge of it here on the DC2000 tape so that's fine. So the only thing we have to figure out is firstly whether this will physically go into the drive and then secondly how to raise the position of the uh, drive wheel on the machine so it can actually successfully uh, transport the tape. So we'll get the machine back over and see if these will fit in and uh, we'll go from there and see how to modify the drive to accept the DC2000. Okay, if we start with the HP tape, then when we press this into the drive, it's captive using just the, um, the actual bottom plate. It's not the entire cassette that's used to position it and this uh, plate just slides underneath these two guides. So as we start to push it in, two things happen. Firstly, it's positioned so it's at the right height, and secondly, the right-hand guide opens the tape cover. So as I press this in, the cover opens, passes through a cutout in the back of the drive, but the cassette is now kind of captive underneath uh, these two tabs 
and they hold on to the base plate. And then as we push it further in, these two tabs, these two cutouts, uh, engage with the two sprung catches on the drive and then their kind of over center action sprung and once you go beyond a certain point the tape is pulled into the drive using these two cutouts and then when you press the eject button it does the reverse and it pushes on the back edge of these two cutouts and ejects the tape so as we push it in it engages gets pulled in it's held firmly and um, if we want to eject it we just press the eject button but notice there's quite a lot of clearance above the top of the tape which is good for us so if we eject that and we get the DC 2000 tape so firstly as we start to put this in luckily because the tape uh, base plate is the same thickness it fits underneath the two guides the flap opens because the actuating part of this flap is in the same place and it engages on the part of this guide that's meant to open that door it won't go all the way in though because this is actually higher so this uh, is too tall so we'll have to look at that later um, but other than that it looks like it should fit in quite well uh, but of course the drive wheel won't be high enough to drive the tape so we'll need to do something about that it's also a different type of um, magnetic material so we'll need to make a slight modification to account for that as well so the next thing I'll do is get the uh, tape drive out of the computer and then we'll start looking at how to modify it. So I've removed the drive from the machine and we'll start by inserting the standard HP tape and you can see that as I start to insert this the tape door opens and then that passes through the cutout in the back of the drive and it emerges through the rectangular opening and you can see that um, there's plenty of clearance around this flap and again that works in our favour because um, there's enough room above this to hopefully allow us to modify this to fairly easily accept the DC2000. So if I remove this and we'll push the DC 2000 tape notice again the flap opens and luckily that does pass through the opening in the drive itself the plastic housing uh, but it fouls on the PCB but it's only about half a millimeter so I can quite easily remove a small amount of the PCB material and this will then pass all the way in so I'm going to do that first before we do anything else I'll just file away a little bit of the PCB material to allow the tape to physically go all the way into the drive that way we can measure it more accurately and see what else we need to do. So I used a small file to file away some of the PCB material didn't have to take too much off um, about half a millimeter and I just went as far as the plastic moulding there's no point going any further than that because of course the plastic moulding itself will then be in the way um, so I've gone um, not too close to the track so we've got plenty of clearance to the track and while I was at it I also filed a 45 degree chamfer on the top edge of the hole you want me to see it, but just on the top edge of the hole that the uh, plastic door passes through I machined a very slight uh, chamfer on there and that's just to make sure that the uh, flat will go through the opening without kind of fouling and getting stuck against the plastic moulding if um, it's fairly close but as soon as the, um, the, the flap gets towards the hole it will get guided properly into it. So we can now take the DC2000 tape and in theory this should now fit into the drive. So you can see it's not fouling on anything we've got a bit of clearance probably a good half a millimeter clearance and if I push this all the way in it goes all the way in it's captive and it's being properly held notice that the record um, button is now in the record recess so it's not being pressed and if we slide this across it, then it should now press that in as we insert the cartridge which it does so that's working as well 
properly held in place, it's nice and firm and we can see that the tab has come out through the back and it's free to move so it's not fouling against the top edge of that opening and all we need to do now is see if it will eject cleanly which it does slides out nice and easily so we can now physically fit this into the drive without any problems so the next thing is the more difficult task of extending the height of the roller so again it's probably not something you can easily see but the top edge of the roller is sitting pretty much on the bottom edge of the drive wheel so we need to extend the height of it by approximately the thickness of the drive wheel itself. It doesn't matter if we go slightly further because the only thing that's above that is the plastic moulding. So what we can do is go up to within maybe half a millimetre of the top of this moulding. Maybe a millimetre, there's plenty of space there. Uh, so uh, we'll get this out of the drive and see what the best method is to modify this to use the new type of tape. As I've already refurbished the rest of the drive I don't need to dismantle the top cover again. I can just remove the motor itself. It's just four screws and then a couple of solder joints and uh, we can then withdraw the motor and unplug it of course. And uh, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, remove this, just a couple of grub screws and then we should be able to slide this uh, drive uh, spindle off the motor. We need to be really careful with this, the encoder disc is fairly fragile and we don't want to damage that otherwise this will be history. And um, we'll get this uh, pulled off and um, that will give us better access to see what we're actually up against. Okay so that's the drive spindle removed from the motor. Um, what I'd really like to be able to do here is take the encoder disc off and remanufacture a completely new drive spindle but I really don't fancy my chances of being able to get this encoder disc off without damaging it. So what I'm going to do uh, instead is um, make a spindle mount for this so I can mount it into the lathe and then I'm going to machine down this top section so I can make a new part to go over the top uh, and then we can machine that uh, however we want. The reason I'm doing it that way rather than just gluing on an extension is because I want to include a couple of shallow uh, side cheeks, one at the bottom, one at the top, so that the rubber drive wheel doesn't need to be glued in place. It'd be easy to uh, change in the future. And putting a maybe half millimetre high uh, cheek on each end will stop it from walking off the spindle. Uh, so that's the next step. We'll get this into the lathe, um, get it machined, make up the replacement part and uh, go from there. So I've been looking at this um, component and trying to figure out the best way to proceed and um, what I'm trying to achieve with my videos is to give people ideas as to how to go about repairing things. Uh, also hopefully them uh, be a bit interesting in their own right. Uh, but uh, what I've decided to do in this uh, case is to try and combine the two. And a um, slight change uh, to the, the plan I originally had for several reasons. One is because the only way I can really mount this with the encoder fitted is to effectively put a pin like this in my lathe and that means this won't be particularly rigid it would be okay if I machined uh, very carefully and slowly um, but I decided there'd be uh, uh, there's an alternative maybe a better way for me and that is I'm going to machine this section off completely and um, turn it down to what amounts to just a pin and the reason for doing that is it will then let me use something like this so I'll combine uh, what I showed in a previous video on how to make these into uh, part of this repair video. So I'm going to modify this so I can fit um, really either custom or standard uh, pinch rollers. And so this will fit onto the top of this. Uh, the key to this working successfully, of course, is machining this in such a way that it will be properly centered. Even a very small amount of runout 
or mismatch between these two is going to cause a lot of vibration and the system just won't work right. Uh, so I'll need to get that uh, done correctly. What I'd normally do at this point is jump through to the uh, next stage which would be this assembled and ready to refit uh, into the drive. But I've been asked to show more of the detail for machining these uh, parts so that's what I'm going to do. In the next video I'll show how I'm going to go about machining this and uh, what we can then do is start reassembling the drive and see if it actually works. If that's the sort of thing you want to see more of then please leave a comment. If you'd rather I just jump through to the major steps and major stages then again leave a comment. But uh, the next video we'll look into machining this part.